It's time for Supply Chain Now Radio, broadcasting live from the supply chain capital of the country, Atlanta, Georgia. Supply Chain Now Radio spotlights the best in all things supply chain, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and the critical issues of the day. And now, here are your hosts. Hey, good morning. Scott Luton here with you live on Supply Chain Now Radio. Welcome back to the show. Uh, On today's show, we are going to be continuing a new series here at Supply Chain Now Radio, the Transportation Trends Series, where we've been diving into a wide variety of the trends, challenges, issues facing the backbone of the end-to-end supply chain industry, which is transportation. Uh, We we have started this three-part series uh, on a critical development, the shipping pricing changes that FedEx uh, rolled out, and now in, in in the second installment, we're going to be diving into the changes that UPS rolled out. Um, so, the series is going to continue with our third episode uh, after uh, today's conversation, where we're going to kind of do a com- uh, comparison and contrast of all the pricing changes and uh, get ready for 2020 for sure. Um, we're conducting a series with none other than spend management experts, and we couldn't have a better subject matter expert to walk us through all the complexities of these changes. I've learned a ton through these conversations. So more on our special guests in just a minute. A uh, quick programming note, like all of our series on Supply Channel Radio, you can find our replays on a variety of channels, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, wherever you. you get your podcasts from. As always, love to have you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. Real quick, let's thank... Uh, our sponsors that allow us to bring these best practices and innovative ideas to you, our audience, the Effective Syndicate, Vector Global Logistics, ProPurchaser.com, Apex Atlanta, and many more. You can check out each of our sponsors on the show notes of this episode. So let's bring in my fearless co-host for today's show once again, Greg White, serial supply chain tech entrepreneur, trusted advisor, chronic disruptor. Greg, good morning. Good, good morning. I'm glad you brought back Chronic Disruptor, man. <laughs> hey, you know, they're, they're like a starting rotation. We just swap them in, swap yeah. them out. How are you doing? We're doing fantastic. I don't think people ask you that enough. <laughs> How are you doing? Well, outstanding week, uh, outstanding month of November. And, you know, this series has been well received. I think when we published the first episode of this series, we had hundreds of plays within the first 24 hours and mm-hmm. i think not only does that speak to uh, who's on the show and, and the best practices but also the relevance of the topic yeah right? no doubt who is not challenged with uh, these pricing changes that are impacting peak season and 2020 in very big meaningful ways which we're going to uh, dive in on in a second well we talk about the impact on the carriers mm. but the truth is it's going to impact consumers as well because as these fees go up, which they seem to always do, yes. right? We never have these conversations where the fees are going down. Yes, um, it's gonna it's gonna have to get passed through to the consumer. So these are things we ought to be concerned about as mm. well as consumers. And as we uh, double down on the first episode, there's no such thing as free shipping. That's right. Uh, so let's bring in and welcome our special guest here once again today, John Haber, founder and CEO of Spin Management Experts, a big. Uh, 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 advocate that of all things, no free shipping. Loved that from the first episode. John brings over 25 years of supply chain experience, and, and you're working with, uh, John, you and SME are working with all kinds of, of companies, including some of the biggest brands, to drive greater efficiencies within their supply chains, right? Absolutely. Thanks for having me back. You bet. Well, um, again, the first episode was a home run uh, on the FedEx uh, pricing changes and looking forward to d- diving into the UPS changes here today. But before we do that, uh, let's see what's going on from the supply do chain. News? All right, radio news yeah, desk, please. man. Uh, so this is really interesting, and I think timely considering what we're about to talk about mm. and the time of the year. Um, so we're airing live now, but I think this will release probably the first part of the week of Thanksgiving, right? Very so, quickly, yeah, <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> so get this: uh, a survey recently done um, by Zebra Technologies. Thirty-nine percent of consumers have ditched shopping in stores for online purposes because out of stocks in the stores. Mm. So that's some seventy-five percent of millennials have left a store mm. because um, without purchasing the item and instead bought it online. And over fifty percent of Gen Xers, way to go, my generation, um, <laughs> the best. Yeah, that's right. Stand strong. Um, you know, have left a store. In, you know, brief story. One of the Pivotal moment, moments in one of my last technology ventures was when my wife 
went into a Best Buy store mm. and wanted to buy TV, sound system, everything for Ooh. a room, theater room we were doing. And the person in the Best Buy store said, sorry, we don't have it. And she said, no problem. Right on her phone, she went to a ubiquitous, at the mm. time we had to call them a ubiquitous online retailer, <laughs> Amazon, and bought it right there in front of the sales rep. Mm. And that's happening more and more. Mm. Um, I you think know. you're seeing it uh, on the omni-channel struggles of retailers shipped from store is creating havoc on the inventory in the stores. It is. And it's causing a lot of problems. Mm. It is. And, it, and you know, returns are a big part of what stores are used for these days. And it's, it, it's interesting because if you go far enough back into retail, the whole issue with this is because retailers separated the, their store operations efforts from their online efforts because the store operations management didn't want to be burdened with the cost mm. and possible impact on their be- on their bonus of this newfangled um, you know online retail yeah and so. if you look at the returns with Kohl's where you can return yes. Amazon's packages Kohl's had a dismal earnings mm. report yeah. this week and they're not seeing that it's driving additional purchases in, in the, the stores store. right so it's a big problem that's for Kohl's. that is really interesting because since I, I think there's no direct relationship because other retailers do see Mm -hmm. some some accretive value of taking returns in their stores but it's their customers if you're taking returns for amazon you could be taking returns for a bicycle Mm. and and kohl's doesn't sell bicycles or anything related or you could be taking returns for a fish tank (laughs) um (laughs) and so there's not a there's not a you know relationship to what they might buy in that store Mm. and i think that's that is a, a lingering problem with them um, so in the spirit of one of my favorite terms, uh, ABA, any th- anyone but Amazon, there's this whole class of providers out there who are trying to create services similar to FBA, marketplaces mm. and fulfillment um, uh, fulfillment uh, services and, and last mile services and that sort of thing. Another little tidbit of news is that several 3PL providers are strategizing on how to work with and in some cases against Amazon. So sure. some months, months or years back, I wrote this article, um, Enemies with Benefits, about Amazon and how you survive in the Amazon era. And mm. some of it is to embrace that, and some of it is to work against that Amazon's mm. influence in the marketplace to your own benefit as well. But um, John, I think you were, uh, had some recent conversations with uh, one of those Similar organizations in the yeah, past week, right? Just yesterday, I was at a, uh, a huge new facility in McDonough, Georgia, with a company called Project Vert, and uh, it's an end-to-end market marketplace fulfillment all the way to last mile delivery mm-hmm. uh, using blockchain. Uh, fantastic, uh, up-and-coming company, and uh, they're they're here to compete with Amazon. That's mm. great. Mm. They've there have been other providers who've done that in the past. They uh, eBay eBay Enterprises, which became Radial and now is Belgian Post, tried that. They were never able to kind of hit the profit model and yeah. and stem cash flow to be able to do it. But we're talking about about $142 billion um, worth of logistics costs that mm. these these companies um, incur and, and provide services around. So it, and there's no sign of slowdown of growth yeah. in that area. So I think that's a good that's a good sign for consumers for Amazon to have competitors. Right? Yeah. And speaking of blockchain, John, there continues to be more and more practical use cases out there. I think a lot of folks within the global end end supply chain community hear blockchain mm. and all of a sudden it's cliche. Their eyes roll back. Right. However, just like we've been reporting on the show uh, between Hewlett Packard and DHL, they, they've been using. Uh, uh, blockchain to better streamline one-off orders. Uh, news came out in the last week or two about Wal- how Walmart Canada is using blockchain in new ways. It's mm-hmm. delivering a real practical return. We're going to see more and more of this yeah. in the months ahead, right? Sure. I think people are confused by blockchain. A lot of people don't really understand what it means and what it is. Mm, yeah. But blockchain is here to stay. Mm. And if you look at the large organizations, IBM is uh, developing really solid blockchain mm. um, uh, proprietary uh, methods and methodologies. Yeah, yep. driving change. The power sure. of the inalterable record, mm-hmm. right? I mean, if you think about this, the power of being able to track things and not have, if you think about it as simply as possible, mm-hmm. being able to track what happened and not have any alteration occur to that gives a credible c- accountability in the mm-hmm. supply chain. So, there, or or really in any 
step-by-step uh, -step process mm -hmm. in truth. So you, there are a lot of uses for that. Absolutely. And really valuable. And one of Amazon's biggest problems is counterfeit goods being right. sold on Amazon and blockchain helps solve that problem. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Well, and the sourcing also. I mean, they've had yep. some trouble with not, not just counterfeit, but some... Um, whatever we want, uh, undesirable <laughs> paint, lead paint and things like that, mm. some undesirable uh, components of some of their products as well. Mm. Yeah, where the, where the materials are being sourced. Right, mm. right. Um, yeah. All right, so one final tidbit, and I think this will help us kind of roll into our discussion today. So FedEx announced just yesterday, I think, uh, um, that uh, they expect to move about 33 million packages uh, through their global network on Cyber Monday. So think about that mm. from a scale standpoint. Um, you know, Incredible. They're predicting that um, overall predictions are that e-com sales will be up around 5% or so. Um, I think it will be higher based on the first news we heard today. People are having reason to continue to abandon the in-store experience. Mm. Um, and And... Uh, you know, I think that's an incredible amount of volume, mm. and and FedEx and UPS are taking full advantage that's of right. that volume, aren't yeah. they? They are. So, well, so let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, so, let's get to know you a little bit better before um, before we talk about those issues around shipping. So, I, I've been watching this series called Poldark. And uh, I think of you as the Ross Poldark of, <laughs> of parcel shipping. You, That's a new one for me. You were once once part of the establishment. Vin Diesel, I hear a lot, but the Poldark is a new one. Well, he's a stud. I so, like that. Yeah, yeah. He was he was a member of the establishment, and now is helping us common folk navigate the establishment. And I think that's similar to what you do, right? You sort Great of help, analogy. Yeah, you sort of help people understand the environment that they're operating in and mm. how they can, um, you know, how they can make their way through it in a cost-effective fashion. So we're going to mm. talk about some of those costs, mm. but tell us a little bit about you and, and, you know, where you came from. I can't believe there's anybody watching here that doesn't know who John Haber is, so you don't have to go back to your childhood, but, you know, just tell us a little bit about what's shaped your kind of vision and worldview. Uh, in a, my previous life, uh, I spent about a decade uh, at corporate finance and corporate strategy at UPS, and I was, for about half that time, I managed a group that was monitoring the profitability of UPS's largest customers. And what I saw during those years was that uh, UPS was making too much money off mm. the largest customers, really because there's a lack of competition mm -hmm. in the U.S. domestic small market, uh, small parcel marketplace. Mm. And so... Uh, similar to Poldark, UPS would say, I went to the dark side, <laughs> and now I'm helping large shippers uh, create a competitive advantage mm. in the supply chain by optimizing their transportation, distribution, mm. and fulfillment. And it's critical, especially if you look at uh, retail. Uh, the supply chain can either be, it's either a make or break. Mm. It, it could be uh, it's almost survival of the fittest. If you look at all the bankruptcies in retail and the demands of free shipping, right? Uh, it's just imp it's an imperative that you have a, an, an optimized supply chain, and that's what we help deliver to our customers at mm -hmm. Spend Management. So, form Spend Management um, in 2011. I uh, spent uh, five years before that at MPI, which is a boutique consulting firm here in Atlanta okay. that helps companies manage costs in IT and telecom. So we've been helping shippers optimize their costs in the supply chain for uh, almost the last 13 years. Mm. Wow, saving America money for 13 years. <laughs> you, should have that be, you should have that be on your website. New tagline. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, so... Tell us a little bit about, um, look, it's dis it's almost December. Hard to believe. Right? It's yeah. almost December. So when you look at ba look back at 2019, what stands out to you or what's surprised or concerned or enthused you over the last? Yeah, 2019 has been a crazy year. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been so much going on uh, from the tariffs 
which have had a huge impact on uh, shipping and imports and exports mm. and on retail uh, capacity uh, in the truckload market uh, mm -hmm. has changed drastically. You've got FedEx, which has and Amazon have parted ways. That's mm. a billion yeah. dollar revenue mm. loss for FedEx. Uh, FedEx also announced that they're pulling a lot of volume back. Uh, on the smart post product mm. and they're going to deliver it with their own vehicles so that's going to impact the usps so we smart post is that's where they're using <laughs> that's last mile office. delivery by the post office and uh ups uh has sure post fedex has smart post dhl e-commerce is also uses last mile delivery by the post office but what we see is that the the three Amazon, UPS, and FedEx are pulling volume back from the post office mm. into their own networks. It's going to have a huge impact on the post office, and the post office is really struggling. If you yeah, look at their finances, they before. yeah. So it's 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 going to be harmful for mm. the post office. I'm not not sure how you fix the post mm. office with yeah. the pension problems they have. It, it seems like we've been talking about that for decades. Yeah, right? well, you, you got to wonder what is. What's going to be the the straw or the the ton of bricks that's going to finally break the camel's back? There, it just the losses keep mounting, the challenges keep mounting, and all the while, the the market and the landscape for for how they're making deliveries that's constantly changing and, and transforming as well. So it's got a double whammy. It's got to give. Uh, it's not going to give. I mm. can tell you, it's not going to give. It's a semi-governmental entity, and they are beholding to the unions. Mm. Those two things will will force them to bleed money out of us consumers mm -hmm. and taxpayers till the end of time. It's we'll, not going to change. We'll, we'll, we'll strike up a new series and dive deep into let's USPS. Don't. That's such a downer. <laughs> okay. No, let's don't do that. So keep, we'll keep driving for now with John Haber with yeah. uh, SME. So, um, so Scott loves to ask this question uh, because he reads. I'm not much of a reader myself. <laughs> or, do you read much? I read nonstop. Uh, I'm not reading. I'm not really reading books. I'm reading the news mm -hmm. every single day because in the world of logistics, things change at the blink of an eye. I do. Mm -hmm. What's so, your so? Give us an idea. What's your most favorite read, or maybe the biggest revelation you've seen in in something you've read recently? <sighs> I would say my most favorite recent read was the article in the New York Times uh, last Sunday on FedEx mm. Uh, mm. and their, them not paying any taxes last year. And as a result of the article, Fred Smith, the founder of FedEx, mm. has challenged the, uh, the author of the article to a public debate. Wow. Really? Um, and which, you know... I tend to think that the factual information in the article is correct, but I really want to see this debate. Mm. And I think that the New York Times is pretty wimpy mm. because if you're going to write an article and you think it's accurate, why, why not, not get up it? and defend it? Right. So I think that what I see, you know, is there's a lot of media that mm. is spreading half truths. Mm, yeah. I'm not saying that article is half truths, but, right, but if, it you, if you're going to stand up on that and be behind your article, then get up and debate Fred Smith. I think that would be thoroughly must see entertaining. Yeah. Must, see must see TV. I'd rather see those debates than some of the others we're, we're having. But that, I mean, kudos to Fred Smith because I'm sure any time uh, an organization that big, leadership's got to be real careful when they wade into, you know, uh, different conversations. But for someone to draw the line to the sand and challenge you know, and and stand up for the organization. That kudos. We need I, more of that. I think it's about time. Yeah, I mean, yes. really, because look, the way that news happens today is the first one to say it is sure. considered authoritative and accurate, mm. right? Mm. So I think you need to. If if you can't be that, and you can't always, then you've got to actively and openly um, and broadly challenge that. Mm. That's going to be a really interesting thing. I didn't know about that. That's mm. really cool. Yeah. Yeah. You should check it out. That's why I like asking the question. So aside from <laughs> New York times, where else do you get news and industry insights? I get a, a ton of content from LinkedIn, uh, and Twitter. And because it's, it's one 
in those two places, I can go and get so much information mm-hmm. and get it very fast and yeah. get it condensed. And so I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. You uh, scroll through it. Scroll through it. I see you guys on there. I see all your great <laughs> material. Kathy Robertson, who's one of the uh, best. our head research analyst, is yeah. putting out great content. But uh, the CSCMP newsletters are also good. Mm-hmm. Um, but LinkedIn is really the my source, my go-to source on a daily basis to understand what's happening happening uh in the in the moment yep. yeah do you, you start know, do you follow any particular hashtags or do you just i mean it, it, linkedin does such a good job based on what your career is and that sort of thing do you have to follow any particular hashtags or anything to get what you want or uh I, i'm following a lot of the trade public uh trade publications mm-hmm. on transportation journal mm-hmm. commerce inbound logistics mm-hmm. yep. uh parcel magazine where I've got a column, um, following all those, follow, uh, obviously, Supply Chain Now Radio. Um, <laughs> thanks, thanks for that plug. <laughs> <laughs> That's outstanding. So, And, and you know, one last comment, because we're, we're going to dive into these UPS pricing changes. You know, Twitter gets a bad rap in many areas. You know, it's like saying podcasts, right? Some folks already have kind of preconceived notions. But, gosh, the wealth of data and information on Twitter and how you can find it right then and the timeliness of it, that, that's as a news source, Twitter is highly underrated, I've always thought. Well, you can it, – it is now because you can filter it such that you can cut out all the noise. Mm. And, you and there is see, a bunch of that. And you can see what you want to see. That's right. Right? So – yeah, you don't have to. You don't have to hear shouting contests, yes. right? No. Well, today we are uh, really looking forward to diving in and getting your expertise on these uh, UPS pricing changes, which is going to you know reverberate out throughout the marketplace, impact peak season or, or continue to impact peak season, an, an extended peak season, but also 2020. So uh, they were just released with just in the last uh, day or two. Let's get your initial thoughts on the pricing changes. The the, the big key takeaways here. Uh, the the big key takeaways are that it's another f- at least 5% rate increase. And it doesn't sound like that's a big deal because shippers are conditioned to expect a 5% rate increase every year. If you look at the consumer price index mm. over the last 10 years, that's only going up maybe 2%. And so UPS and FedEx are raising rates 5% every year. That's more than double the price increases Mm -hmm. that competitive industries are experiencing. So that's kind of just, you know, people are snoring at the Mm -hmm. the 5% increase. The reality is the increase for a lot of shippers is way more than 5% Mm -hmm. due to some policy changes. They've got some new additional fees that Mm -hmm. they're rolling out, but the policy changes are going to be incredibly impactful to shippers, especially uh, people that are shipping heavy goods. Mm, Right, which Mm -hmm. is happening more and more these days. I mean, people are buying... All kinds of things online, right? right? And and so speaking of the heavy goods, uh, I, I believe uh, one of the biggest changes there is lowering the the, the ceiling of the of, of when those extra fees kick in. So right. tell us more about that. Yeah, uh, both UPS and FedEx have announced a, a policy change for additional handling uh, of packages for packages of of certain weight. Mm. Uh, prior to 2020 rates. Uh, at 70 pounds, there's a surcharge that is applied to a package in addition to the freight charge. Mm. It's called additional handling weight, and it's a $24 charge per package. That wow. is being lowered to 50 pounds mm. in 2020. We just finished doing a cost estimate for one of our big retail clients, and it's going to add $2 million in additional cost in 2020. So when you think they're only taking uh, a 5% rate increase, and they're not taking a 5% rate increase because we've helped them to negotiate a 3% fixed mm-hmm. rate increase, mm-hmm. right. these policy changes are ways to circumvent the, the contract language and push through mm. much larger rate increases. Mm. Shippers don't understand how much is this is going to impact them. Sneaky. Well, $24 doesn't sound like much in and of itself, but when you start, to your point, when you start mapping it out across the enterprise and certainly over multiple shipments and, and high volume of shipments, it can add up, as you're saying, $2 million and more in a heartbeat. Well, it, I mean, in, and if you're talking about something like a fish tank, which is big and bulky, heavy, I mean, there's not that much margin. Mm. I mean, this the thing that 
concerns me is how are retailers going to absorb this because their margins are relatively tight as it is and the truth is they're not mm. going to absorb it mm. they're going to have to pass it through they're going to they're going to have to but it's very difficult because yeah. everyone expects Pricing free pressure. shipping right mm. Mm. right but the, i mean th- they may reflect it another way in the price of the product and when they may absorb a portion of it but we're going to continue continue to see pricing edge upwards because of these kind of costs, right? Absolutely. Yep. So how does a how does a retailer combat that? I mean, you say that the the contract terms allow FedEx to do that. Is there a way around around that, or do you have to wait till the next contract negotiation and try to no figure out? You should never wait uh, till the next contract till your contract expires. You need to be proactive in managing your costs on a daily basis because the carriers are changing rate increases no longer just happen in january Mm -hmm. or at the end of december right we're tracking rate increases they're occurring on a weekly basis and Mm. so you've got to pay attention to uh the fine print and you've got to get back up to the negotiation table immediately Mm. right now we're running forecasts for all of our clients showing them what the cost impact is Mm. and we're going back in and challenging the carriers Mm. and renegotiating Mm. and if we need to switch swap out you know to a different provider Mm -hmm. uh, because of these cost increases then all options we're going to do it all right so so big Early lesson learned learn there. Don't wait. Read the invoices. Fi- dive into the details and be proactive. You always have options. So before we talk more about the uh, th- three new surcharges, which is a little bit more uh, to be expected, any other uh, uh, insights or um, response to the, the policies, the impactful policies in general? Uh, the, the yeah the the responses are obviously you've got to really understand we just did a, a presentation a parcel form a big trade show mm. on uh 20 on surcharges and surcharges are becoming a much larger portion of your overall cost structure mm. so we went through how to f- how to uh, understand how the surcharges are, are formulated, understand the cost, understand how to forecast them. One of the other big changes that's coming out with both UPS and FedEx that's a policy change is that they are increasing the number of zip codes that a delivery area surcharge applies. Mm. They're increasing that by almost 5%. Mm. So if you look at how much the cost increases are for delivery area surcharges, they're, they're tremendous on the extended rural deliveries. It's so, re- this, is really, this is really interesting because I'm, I'm thinking back to our discussion around the FedEx rate changes, and yep. it's almost like UPS is mirroring those changes that FedEx has made. They is have. that a fair estimation? FedEx announced the policy change from 70 to 50 pounds. UPS followed suit exactly. Mm-hmm. All right, so back on these delivery area surcharges, um, what is your, in the bigger sense, it, what, how is it UPS, what market share are they looking to acquire? Or what, what are they looking to do with these delivery area surcharges? Well, what is happening is that you see uh, a lot more rural deliveries. Mm-hmm. And each, every zip code uh, in the U.S. is classified by UPS FedEx as either an extended delivery area surcharge, which mm-hmm. is going to be the more rural areas, a regular delivery area surcharge. Uh, we may be in a regular delivery area surcharge right now, even mm-hmm. though we're in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> mm-hmm. right. Or there's no delivery area surcharge that applies. But what's happening is that uh, in the more rural areas, people are not driving 20 miles to a Walmart. Mm. They're ordering it online. And they're getting free shipping, and it's being delivered to their home. Mm. So there's a, a big increase on the uh, deliveries to these more rural areas. Mm. Huge price increases mm. on that surcharge. UPS is going up over 18% on that surcharge in particular. Mm. Mm. It, it, is that uh, – how is that going to factor into the ratio of business that falls between UPS and, and USPS? How do you see that breaking? Well, what you see is that uh, Amazon 
uh, who's delivering a lot of packages. They're cherry picking volume in the dense urban areas, mm. and then they're trying to push the lower density deliveries to the post office, mm. to UPS, to FedEx, uh, and those are much less profitable deliveries. So those mm. cost increases are are really due to what Amazon's doing there and the facts and the fact that the 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 rural deliveries are increasing so mm. much. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. I think they they're pushing some of that lesser volume to their prime carriers because those are contract carriers. Those, Absolutely. Those cute little gray vans and they are very good looking <laughs> vans by the way that you see driving around. Those are not owned by Amazon. No. And for the most part, they are owned by contract carriers yeah. like the people who deliver for FedEx. Yeah, DHL and ISPs, like that. Yeah. Ind- yeah. independent service providers. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's change gears a little bit. Let's talk more about the three specific new surcharges. Uh, the processing fee, I think, related to imports, epor- uh, imports, uh, exports, customs, the prohibited item fee, and the rebill fee. Rebill fee. Talk more about those. Yeah, uh, it, those are, like I said, don't see those as game changers mm. from a cost standpoint. The, prohibit- the prohibited items... Those prohibited items have existed. What they've done and what they're going to do is they're going to put in a $150 fine. Mm. It applies to a lot of things. One of the interesting things I saw listed was shark fins. I don't know how mu- how many people are sh- shipping shark fins mm. around, but obviously very <laughs> sensitive. Um, hmm. uh, you're not supposed to be shipping marijuana through UPS, so that's also uh, what? on the list. What? Yes, I know. Since when? It's shocking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, most of it's common sense, but what they're doing is... i got to make a phone call. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Big problem for you right there. Uh, but they're, they're imposing you know, large fines when they catch people shipping these banned items. No currency. Uh, watches that are mm. over a certain value, I mm. believe over $500, and it's not supposed to move through the UPS network. Mm. Um, so it's, 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 it's wow. m- meant to deter people from shipping these items mm. with these large fines associated with the uh, with these banned banned uh goods and i'm assuming they're uh impound for lack of a better word impounding these items confiscating them yep yeah absolutely okay um and then some of the usual suspects again we kind of we talked about the most the, the made the most impactful aspects of the pricing changes up front and then we're kind of moving through these surcharges and then you got some of these usual suspects the address correction fees the signature fees some of these things were part of these price pricing changes as well right absolutely uh signature required uh is a big one you see big increases on those charges uh <clears throat> it's you know People are moving to more signature required because there's a lot of theft mm. of packages. And, you know, if you if you have a signature, then you can prove that the, someone received the package. I was just in New York City uh, Monday through Wednesday. I went to my cousin's apartment building. There must have been 50 packages sitting in the lobby mm-hmm. on a table. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, so it's just not – they're not secure. And what the signature required, it helps It helps uh, on a claim for close the carriers. Loop. It helps close the loop. Yeah. But it takes more time for the carriers, and so they're increasing <clears throat> the fees associated with that. Mm. Mm-hmm. Address corrections is one of my favorite. Uh, it's, you know, seventeen dollars to do an address correction. That's you probably you know What's double the cost of what, what the shipper is with. paying to move the package from point A to point B. Uh, it's a huge margin area. Mm-hmm. In most cases, the address is corrected before the delivery attempt is even made. Mm-hmm. So that's a that's a that's a money maker. Mm. Okay, so before we move into um, suggestions from your end on how to mitigate some of these, I- any other changes that we're leaving out that, that you found really important to mention? Uh, again, what, what, what I think uh, is really important for people to understand is that there are these price increases which have just come out and they're announced, and you really need to understand those. There are going to be more price increases in 2020. 
every month. Mm. Uh, they're going to change the fuel surcharge indexes. You've got to pay attention and monitor the stuff, and you've got to really analyze how these changes are going to impact your business. Mm. You've got to have good forecasting techniques in order to really understand the impact of your business mm. because – it's the survival of the fittest, especially mm. in the retail world. And shipping is one of the largest costs. It's it's it could be, you know, it's it can make or break your your company. Mm. Mm. And you need to preempt these things. I mean, you hate to find this out after the fact, right? I mean, you need to preempt these sometimes you, ridiculous you, fees, mm. <laughs> right? Like you need a to, like a. Mm. Uh, you need to be at the negotiating table now. You need yeah. to be negotiating these charges before they go into effect. Yeah, mm. and get it into your process to stay ahead of it. If Absolutely. it's going to change every month, you've got to have someone on top of this thing all the time. Yeah, well, and there's there are a lot of people who think, <clears throat> well, I have a con, I have a pricing agreement, and it's it's goes another three years mm. i can't address it's locked. it's locked frozen you can renegotiate these anytime. contracts anytime hmm. so that so so uh let's back up on that so in all the conversations you're having the oftentimes the customer mindset is okay we've got this contract it's locked in place we negotiated the best term for the next three years or five years or whatever it is we can't touch anything that is not the case that is not the case you hmm. can open those contracts any point in time hmm. okay i mean and why shouldn't you? If they're going to change, if they're going to add, if they're going to make a change and, and issue a price increase, you should be able to challenge that. They, mm. They're changing the game. Mm. You should be able to address it at any point in time. I hear the passion in your voice around this, right? I mean, you really don't like this at all, do you? Well, we're very passionate. We're here to protect our customers. Yeah. Mm. You know? Mm. All right, so you've already offered some of the some of the uh, best practices for for mitigating this. You know, get proactive, uh, get much stronger at your forecasting. Uh, you know, challenge the contract. Don't wait until it expires. Um, I, I want to talk more about some of the unique partnerships that you're seeing, uh, uh, FedEx, UPS, and others t uh, form with these retailers. But before we talk about those, anything else that you would suggest to anyone listening that's dealing with these changes whether it's fedex or ups the most important thing which we which we see a lot of people don't really have is information mm. visibility and transparency as i mentioned during our last discussion you have to have visibility and you have to have good data in order to make informed decisions and we work with some of the largest shippers in the world and it's amazing how fragmented their data is and so you've got to have processes set up where you're getting good data where you can analyze it and you can act upon it and mm -hmm. that's the key to managing this very complicated uh shipping scenario mm. today is that a pretty manual process i mean are they loading stuff into spreadsheets or we see clients that are still getting paper bills they're not even getting the electronic data feeds mm -hmm. i mean you get an invoice that may be a thousand pages long how can you paper paper invoices mailed wow there's no way to analyze that does it come in a box you with barely pay charge it's yeah. so, it's it's, yeah. it's they, mind boggling. Yeah, they charge twenty four <laughs> bucks to deliver it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Um so that's a great note to finish. I'm visibility and transparency. It is all the rage these days in global supply chain, but for good reason, right? Yes. Because it's tough. To, it's tough to manage. Tough to lead. Tough to make smart decisions if you don't have it. Right? Absolutely. All right, so, and we're talking millions and millions of dollars at stake. Millions and yeah. millions easily of dollars. All right, so let's talk about some of the really neat partnerships we're seeing play out across uh, the retail environment. Um, for starters, I want to pick your brain on, on what FedEx and Dollar General are doing. Uh, what FedEx and Dollar General are doing uh, it help is intended to help solve the problem of the rural deliveries. If you look at where Dollar General right. stores are located, they're idea. usually in the rural zip codes. And so they're setting up uh, a process where you can go to Dollar General, you can ship your packages with FedEx, you can pick up your packages from FedEx. That creates delivery density and pickup density mm -hmm. for FedEx by going to a Dollar General rather than to each individual address. It creates convenience mm -hmm. for the customer uh, to 
be able to, to, you know, have a secure location, especially if you're not at home. So there's, it's a more secure delivery. And for Dollar General, it's also intended to increase foot traffic mm. to their stores and hopefully drive an increase in sales for mm. them. Do you it's think, a great concept. I yeah. mean, the, the Dollar General is the new age general mm. store, if you think yeah. about it. I it's mean, everywhere. I, yeah. I got 17 in Walton County on one block. Uh, let's let's uh, so earlier, much earlier in the, in the uh, interview here, you were talking about how Coles and the Amazon relationship hasn't played out like like it looked like it would on paper. Do you think that this relationship between FedEx and Dollar, Dollar, Dollar General will result in more foot traffic for these stores? Yes, I I do believe that. I think it will increase foot traffic for Dollar General. I think Walgreens and FedEx also have a partnership. UPS is one with uh, uh, with Michaels mm. uh, Stores, mm. uh, who's a client of ours. Mm. Um, I think that those will increase uh, foot traffic for them and lead to additional purchases. You've also got these drone deliveries yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, UPS and CVS mm. uh, had a drone delivery. UPS has got uh, drones in a lot of medical centers where mm. they're uh, you know moving stuff from one building to another building. Right. Uh, FedEx has got drone deliveries with autonomous uh, vehicles. Autonomous vehicles, mm, right. but uh, these partnerships are—they're designed to create density, mm. both pickup and delivery, as well as increase the foot traffic to the stores. Mm. I'm not sure why the Kohl's Amazon uh, scenario is not working out. Mm. It's very puzzling. There wasn't a lot of information on that from their CEO you know, during during the the earnings call. Mm -hmm. Wall Street wants more information. Mm. Um, they they're saying that it's going to be better and it's going to improve, but so far the results look fairly lackluster. Mm. So on these drones, um, I haven't seen. Uh, the drone and carrying a package just yet, but we were in Austin, Texas at the uh, EFT Logistics CIO Forum, and we we're talking with um, Rob Cook. Rob Cook with Sheer Logistics, who right. lives in the in the triangle part of North Carolina. Yeah, yeah. And he was talking about the first time he'd seen a drone carrying a package fly over his house, and it was one of those moments that you know you probably won't forget about, right? Yep. Uh, have you seen uh, the drones in action yet? I have not personally seen the drone in action. I think that drone's probably at Wake Medical Center, okay. which is where UPS, it's one of the locations where they're, those dr those dr drones are active yep. doing mm. commercial movements where they're actually getting paid. Mm, I forget you're from North Carolina, so you know yes. all of that stuff, don't the, you? I'm that's from right. the Triangle. Yeah, area. that's right. So I have not had a drone buzz buzz my head, buzz my over me yet, yet. but Next I'm, week. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. So, uh, and, and going back also, Michaels. Michaels, is that the, um, what is their model? They have arts, and crafts, arts, and crafts. arts and crafts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, so they don't quite have the footprint that a Dollar General has, but but still a sizable footprint that UPS is looking to, to uh, leverage. And they're often in similar type centers, not Dollar General, but uh, in similar type centers there with, there with were widely distributed stores absolutely yeah. a lot of uh you know bed bath and beyond mm -hmm. michaels you know you may power have malls Home Depot, right? power malls the dollar general i think is is more, more strategic just because of where they're located mm -hmm. i think that that is uh i think that's a big move for fedex outstanding look forward to we'll have to have you back on uh and uh, have you speak on, on as these developments play out and, and what work, which ones work and which ones don't. Um, one last comment before we make sure our listeners know how to reach out to you, John, and, and uh, your organization, SME. Um, let's talk about the Amazon Box experience we had in Texas. First, first time I think we both had used that, right? Uh, first time I had actually used it for returns some years back. Holding out on but, me. Well, they, you know, they, they, they have kind of ebbed and flowed on this. Um, I don't know exactly how many years back, but there was one at a Meineke muffler store yeah. near um, near our house, and then it disappeared. Mm. So they, they like Amazon is prone to do, they piloted this, um, and then they pulled back to areas of greater density because in Atlanta, the predominant location is around Georgia Tech campus, not mm. far from here, yep. here at King Plow. Um, but I had not seen, uh, I had not seen them in any... Mm any level of of distribution mm. until we were in Austin and it was a 
it was convenience so convenient. store. Right? Yeah. So so I'm I'm always a skeptic when it comes to these things, especially when you're traveling and you really want to make sure it works. We ordered. Luckily, we didn't. It wasn't equipment we needed for our our mobile show, but it was a couple things. That was, it would be nice to have. And, you know, you didn't want to give the, the hotel front desk because you're not sure who's working it. Sure. And well, when it that, comes in. And that stack of boxes that you talk about in yes. the lobby, it happens in hotels as well. Yeah. I mean, people Good are point. doing that. Yeah. It's so, probably a 7-Eleven. It was. It was. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. UPS has got should, lockers in the 7-Elevens. Okay. John would know. John, yeah. <laughs> it was a 7-Eleven. Right. It was just a block down. Uh, I was like, Greg, we're going to give this thing a try. We, we pulled down to 7-Eleven right as we got there in Austin, uh, right down the road from the, the hotel. And fill up with gas. Grabbed a Slurpee. Yeah. And, <laughs> and big gulp. Yes. Yeah, right. And it was there early. It was there probably six hours before the, that uh, 9 o'clock p.m. or 8, 8 p.m. East Central Time deadline was. So so for us, it worked out outstandingly. Well, because yeah, the they're making the commercial deliveries before the residential deliveries. Mm, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, uh, for our listeners, if, if you hadn't tried it and if you thought about trying it, it's worked really well for us. And we'll kind of see if this, this go around, this deployment sticks this time. Maybe you'll see that box at your Monarchy. Uh, I, think in, I, think, <laughs> I think in certain areas you'll see it. They have a better idea of, of what creates the level of density that makes it make sense mm. for them. I, mm. I don't know if we'll see it. Now it's not a Meineke. Mm. By the way, unfortunately, yeah. oh, no. well, you certainly will see them in the, in Whole Food stores and yes. the 365 yeah. stores. Mm. Yep, the, go the go stores and some of the yep. bigger uh, markets. Yeah. All right, so John, you as you mentioned, you just got back from the uh, what was the Texas uh, trade show you were at? Uh, Parcel Forum. Parcel Forum. I know you you do a lot of keynotes. You're out uh, the teams out representing, sharing your best practices and and how to na- navigate through these these uh, global supply chain challenges that we have. Um, but how can folks, what's the easiest way for folks to learn more about you and spin management experts? The easiest way to find us is uh, on our website. It's www.spendmgmt.com. You can also find us on LinkedIn and Twitter at Spend Management Experts. Outstanding. Yeah. And you can find John. On LinkedIn. Yes. Yeah. Good right. stuff, always. Yeah, maybe he can give you a list of stuff you should be scrolling through for more information about this. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I'd, right? I'd be happy to. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is kind of a crusade, it really, is a isn't crusade. it? It is. Yes. Um, great second episode. We've got one more installment of this mini series here as we, we kicked off our Transportation Trends series. Looking forward to having you back on as we do kind of a. Um, uh, compare and contrast episode in the next few weeks. But but folks on getting this information on UPS and these changes out really quick. I think a lot of folks can benefit from what you've shared here today. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to the next episode because the cost structures for UPS, while the policy changes are, you know, kind of in lockstep, the, there are a lot of price differences mm. uh, that are that are happening now, more so than in the past, mm-hmm. and so it's really uh, important to understand, you know, what the costs are with UPS versus mm. FedEx. And I'm looking forward to talking about some of the differences in costs between the two carriers. We're gonna slice yeah, and dice great. it all up next episode. Uh, big thanks to John Haber. Uh, we'll spend management experts for joining us here today and sit tight. We're going to wrap up on a couple of final announcements here that, that talking about some events where I bet you and your team can be found as well. Uh, but for starters to our listeners, uh, if, if we've touched on anything today or any of our past episodes and you can't quite Google it and find what you're looking for, shoot us a note, uh, hit up our CMO, uh, Amanda at supply chain now radio.com. And we'll do our best to serve as a resource for you. So, Greg, we've got a slew of events coming up. Yeah. Uh, we're going to enjoy our time in the studio through the yeah. end of the year, which is a blessing. All right, sit down and have a lot more of these conversations and eliminate some of the over-the-road stuff. Um, but come January, that changes, right? Yep. January, we put our roller skates back on. And uh, on the 15th, fortunately, we're staying home here in Atlanta, uh, the Atlanta uh, CSCMP Roundtable. Um Lunch event with NASTRAC. Yeah, right, with NASTRAC. That's mm-hmm. right, and you can learn more about that at atlantacscmp.org. That's right. January 15th, open to the public. NASTRAC's going to come in and talk about some of the regulation changes taking right. place uh, in the transportation industry and how that is impacting a lot of folks' business. So looking forward to that. Then in February, we're back yeah. out in Vegas, right? Vegas, baby. Yeah, so uh, the Reverse Logistics Association Conference and Expo. So 
and sit down with Tony Sharota and his group, learn from a lot of speakers about what is going on in reverse logistics with returns and circular economy and all of those things that are also a huge cost, mm. um, not just from a shipping standpoint, but from a, logisti- a logistics and a cost uh operational cost standpoint for so many retailers these days right yep john you know on that first episode we did we touched more on returns and and and, and the role right. that's playing in, in, in this e-commerce era we didn't touch on as much here today but that's a huge factor these days right 62 percent of consumers um like the option of being able to buy online and return in store so mm. it's a huge cost mm. it's right? a huge you, cost we have some we have a, a retail client where 50 percent of what is bought online is returned wow. Mm. wow it creates all kinds of inventory problems and positioning people you know want free shipping on mm. the returns people Costs. are are using e-commerce as almost as a as a as a dressing room. Yeah, that's you know, right. You buy five <laughs> pairs of shoes from Zappos, try them on, you keep one, and you ship the other four back. Mm. Yep. With that, with that as a backdrop, organizations and professionals and supply chain leaders are looking more and more for best practices to uh, mitigate these consumer buying habits that we all are, have been trained on now. So the RLA does a great job of, of facilitating that. So February fourth. To the 6th out in Vegas, you can learn more at rla.org, and we'll be broadcasting live throughout that event. Uh, and then Modex 2020 has come back to Atlanta the week of March 9th, right, Greg? Hard to find a show around supply chain, strictly around supply chain, that's on any greater scale than mm. this show. 35,000 of your closest supply chain friends, March 9th to the 12th in mm. Atlanta at the Georgia World Congress Center, Modex 2020. Um, we're going to be broadcasting streaming live there um and and meeting with a bunch of uh you know really talented folks look if you like to see Mm. supply chain in action it's free to anyone that's true and they are building factories they are building um fulfillment facilities and reverse uh returns facilities right there on the show floor they got a circus train 37 car (laughs) circuit train that comes into atlanta they roll this show out Thirty-five thousand people free to attend uh, you, you're going to have great networking, uh, marketing, intel gathering, um, educational educational sessions. sessions, great keynotes, modexshow.com, M-O-D-E-X show.com. And we're there all four days. Yep. John, we'll probably have you on the show while we're there. We'll be there. It's a um, great show. It is a great show. Um, and it's free. I mean, you can't beat that. Uh, and we're also big fans. I've got a Modex tattoo because they're hosting our 2020 Atlanta Supply Chain Awards. All right. Which we're excited about. I don't want to see the tattoo. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. all the way across the back. <laughs> uh, um, Christian Fisher, president and CEO of Georgia Pacific, yeah. is our keynote for the uh, 2020 ASCA. Uh, and Shan Cooper, uh, former Lockheed executive, former West Rock executive, current executive director of the Atlanta Committee for Progress, is our MC. Serious supply chain street oh, cred there. wow. Yeah, yeah. one-two punch. Uh, and nominations, registrations, and sponsorships are all open for that event. It's hosted by Modex Atlanta, supplychainawards.com. Big thanks to SME for serving as a big supporter, uh, which helped us get the first-year awards off the ground. And I think we already have probably a couple dozen companies nominated for yeah. We had a few come in awards. last night. I yep. think. Yep. It's a. It's. A, I'm really glad that you guys started that. It's. It's been missing from Atlanta. There's so much great supply mm. chain activity in Atlanta, and to to highlight the the amazing things that mm. these organizations are doing in the supply chain, we're really glad you guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have it's about time, this. don't you think? I yeah. Mean, I, I think is. we mm. we have a lot of. Of credibility as as a supply chain center, mm. as a city and supply chain city, supply chain city. Yeah, <laughs> the chamber of commerce. There yes. you go. Hashtag. Yes. So March tenth, Atlanta Supply Chain Awards dot com. March the week of March 9th, Modex Show uh, and Modex Show dot com. Yeah. Uh, make sure you check that out. And then finally, one final event we just finalized in the last week or two. We are we are partnering again with the Association for Manufacturing Excellence and their Atlanta 2020 Lean Summit, which is going to be here the week of March, May 4th. Have you ever checked out any AME events? I have not. Okay. Yeah. Um, great manufacturing-centric organization, uh, big player uh, coast-to-coast here in the U.S., highly focused on continuous improvement and lean and leadership, and they'll have two, probably 250, 300 folks that are uh, from plants, 
across the country. They had a team of 25 folks come from a California manufacturing site last year. They so. get really high marks for their for their educational sessions, right, and some of the whatever you want to call it, roundtable type discussions yep. for getting information out. Registration is open for that event. You can learn more at ame.org. Okay. Uh, did we miss anything, Greg? No. <laughs> we, we never miss anything, do we? No. <laughs> well, I, you know, I really enjoyed the com- the perspective. You know, anytime we, we, we have a leader come in and join us and share really from a practical standpoint. You know, John talked about mm-hmm. things you can do today to, insul- to to try to insulate yourself from some of these things that are outside of our control, right? Um, you know, taking action right now, uh, challenging, you know, challenging gathering information, agreement. making things more bi- mi- more visible, making sure you've got the information. Um, you know, don't wait, you know, because uh, there is no such thing as free shipping and, and there's no such thing as, as a contract you cannot challenge. Do right? not procrastinate. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> or Unless you're you going to overpay. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so big thanks again, John the Haber. cost of doing nothing, right? <laughs> Big thanks to John Haber, founder and CEO of the Spin Management Experts. Thanks for uh, y- y- your firm's partnership as we roll this information out via our Transportation Trends series here at Supply Chain Radio. Uh, to our listeners, be sure to check out other upcoming events, replays of our interviews, other resources at SupplyChainNowRadio.com. Greg, where can they find us? At SupplyChainNowRadio.com, <laughs> anywhere you get your podcasts, and especially on YouTube. That's right. <laughs> on behalf of the entire team, uh, Scott Luton here wishing you a wonderful week ahead, and we will see you next time on Supply Chain Now Radio. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm.